during my short excursion to Paris, Her Majesty's left St. Cloud for Rambouillet. I set off to rejoin them with the equipages of the Marshal Prince de Neuchâtel, who had momentarily absented himself from court to be present at the obsequies of the brave Duke de Montebello. If my memory does not betray me, it was on arriving at Rambouillet that I learned the details of a duel fought that very day between two of His Majesty's pages. I do not recollect the cause of their quarrel, but although frivolous enough in the beginning, it had become very serious on account of the acts of violence it occasioned. It was a dispute of schoolboys, but these schoolboys wore swords and regarded themselves not without reason as more than three-fourths soldiers. Hence, it was decided that they should fight. To do so, two things were essential, time and secrecy. As to their time, it was employed almost uninterruptedly from four or five o'clock in the morning until nine in the evening. Secrecy was not observed. Monsieur Dessigny, a man of rare merit and perfect virtue, was then under governor of the pages, and his cares, his kindness, and his justice had endeared him to his pupils. Wishing to avert a misfortune, he summoned the two adversaries to his presence, but these youths destined to the army could not listen to any reparation short of a duel. Monsieur Dessigny had too much sense to interrupt to preach the opposite view. He would not have been listened to, but he offered his services as witness, was accepted by the young men, and asked to select the weapons. He chose the pistol, and rendezvous was given for the next morning at a very early hour. Everything was arranged in the way customary in this sort of affairs. One of the pages fired first and missed his adversary. The other discharged his weapon in the air. At once they rushed into each other's arms and Monsieur Dessigny seized the occasion to give them a truly paternal reprimand. As for the rest, the worthy undergovernor not merely kept their secret, but his own the pistols loaded by him contained only cork bullets. But the young men never knew it. A number of persons were awaiting with curiosity the coming of the 25th of August, the feast of the patron saint of Her Majesty the Empress. They thought that, through fear of awakening the souvenirs of the royalists, the emperor would defer solemnizing it until some other period of the year, which he could easily have done by fetting his August spouse under the name of Marie. But the emperor was not deterred by such fears. It is even probable that he was the only person in the chateau to whom the idea did not occur, sure of his power and of the hopes then built upon him by the French nation. He very well knew that he had nothing to dread from exiled princes or a party which seemed dead beyond the hope of resurrection. I have since heard it said, and very seriously, that his majesty had done wrong in keeping the feast of St. Louis that it had brought him bad luck, ETC. But these prognostics thought of after the event did not at the same time occupy the mind of anybody. And the day of St. Louis was celebrated in honor of the Empress Marie Louise with extraordinary pomp and rejoicings. A few days afterwards, their majesties reviewed in the Bois de Boulogne the regiments of the Dutch Imperial Guard, which the emperor had recently ordered to Paris to celebrate their happy arrival. The emperor had ordered casks of wine staved in at one end to be placed at intervals in the alleys of the wood where every soldier might drink at discretion. This imperial munificence had sorry results, which might have become fatal. The Dutch soldiers, more accustomed to strong beer than the wine, but nevertheless very greedy for the latter drink, used it inordinately and were excited by it to a very disquieting degree. They began at first by disputes, either among themselves or with curious observers who came too near. Then a storm having come up suddenly, and the excursionists from St. Clou and the environs making haste to get back to Paris by crossing the Bois de Boulogne, the Hollanders, in a state of almost complete intoxication, began beating up the wood 
arresting every woman who made her appearance and treating the men by whom they were usually accompanied very rudely. In a moment, the whole wood was resounding with shrieks of terror, vociferations, oaths, and struggles without number. Several frightened people retreated as far as St. Clue, where the emperor was. No sooner was he informed of this disorder than he dispatched patrol after patrol to bring the Hollanders to reason. His majesty was in a great wrath and said, did anyone ever see the likes of these thickheads? There they are, all upset by a couple glasses of wine. In spite of this sort of pleasantry, the emperor was not without anxiety. He came to the park gate opposite the bridge and gave advice to the officers and soldiers who were to attempt the restoration of order. Unfortunately, the night was so advanced that they could not make out just where they ought to go. And God knows how the affair would have terminated if the officer of one of the patrols had not been inspired with the happy thought of exclaiming, The Emperor! Here's the Emperor! His men took up the cry, shouting, Here is the Emperor! as they assaulted the most riotous of the Hollanders. And so great was the terror inspired of these foreign soldiers by the mere name of His Majesty that thousands of armed men, drunk and furious, dispersed but for that alone and regained their quarters as quickly and as secretly as they could, several of them were arrested and severely punished. I have already said that the emperor occupied himself rather frequently with the toilette of the empress and even that of her ladies. As a rule, he liked to see all those who surrounded him dressed well and even richly. Nevertheless, he gave an order about this time, the wisdom of which I admired. He and Her Majesty the Empress were to be sponsors one day for the infants of some of his great officers and foreseeing that the parents would be certain to try and outdo each other in magnificent robes for their newly born children. The Emperor decreed that the babies to be baptized should all wear long white linen robes. This prudent measure spared both the purses and the self-love of the parents. I noticed during the ceremony that the emperor found some difficulty in paying the attention required for answering the questions put by the officiating priest. He was usually somewhat preoccupied during the offices of the church, although they were not long, never lasting more than 12 or 15 minutes. And yet, I have been assured that his majesty had asked if they could not be recited in still less time. He gnawed his nails, took snuff more frequently than common, and was constantly looking around him while a prince of the church was giving himself the useless trouble of turning the leaves of his majesty's book and finding his places for him. At the end of the baptismal ceremony, of which I have just been speaking, the emperor rubbed his hands and said to some of the intimate friends surrounding him, Before long, gentlemen, I hope we shall have another baby to baptize. These words of his majesty were received with all the pleasure they were calculated to inspire. However, her majesty's pregnancy had been talked about for some time at the chateau. It had not occurred immediately after her marriage, and the emperor had been disturbed about it. His first wife had not been able to give him a child, and that fact had been the chief cause of the divorce. Was a similar misfortune to be expected on the part of Marie Louise? For the emperor had... No reason to suspect himself. On the contrary, he had twice already had the honors of paternity. These ideas occasionally made him rather gloomy, and he often consulted his physicians. These gentlemen applied themselves to searching out the cause of the delay which threatened to balk the emperor's most ardent wishes and discovered that the empress took too many baths. The emperor spoke to her about it. She abated their frequency, and we were soon apprised of the happy results. The private garden of Fontainebleau, where we were then, was under my window, and I several times saw the empress walking there, supported by her women, and suffering from those fits of nausea, which made everyone else rejoice. Chapter 17. The pregnancy of Marie Louise had been exempt from accidents and foreboded a safe delivery. The moments for it was acquitted, awaited by the emperor with the impatience of all France, had long shared with him. It was a curious thing at the time to observe the state of the public mind in the beginning of March when the people, uncertain of the sex of the expected infant, were forming all manner of conjectures and uniting their ardent wishes that it might be a son who would receive the vast heritage of the imperial glory. March 19th at 7 o'clock in the evening, the empress felt the first pains. 
from that instant. The whole palace was in a flutter. The news was carried to the emperor. He sent immediately for it. Monsieur Dubois, who had been living in the chateau for some time and whose attentions were so precious on this occasion, all the private attendants of the empress and also Madame de Montesquieu were in the apartment. The emperor, his mother and sisters, and Messieurs Corvissar, Boudier, and Yvonne were in a neighboring salon. The emperor frequently came in to encourage his young wife. Within the palace, expectation was keen, passionate, and noisy. It was who should get the first tidings of the delivery. The pains, which had been feeble during the night, ceased entirely at five o'clock in the morning. Monsieur Dubois, observing no signs of a speedy delivery, said so to the emperor, who dismissed everybody who went to take a bath. The anxiety he was undergoing made this brief moment a repose essential to him. He was greatly moved. He told me how much the empress was suffering, but he added, she is full of strength and courage. Empress, worn out by fatigue, slept for some minutes. She was awakened by hard pains, which constantly increased, yet without bringing on the natural crisis. And Monsieur Dubois became convinced that the delivery would be difficult and laborious. His Majesty had been in his bath scarcely a quarter of an hour when he was announced and came into the bathroom with his face much drawn. He said to the Emperor that out of a thousand confinements, not more than one was likely to present itself as did that of the empress, and that he was afraid he could not save both the mother and the child. Come, then, said the emperor. Don't lose your head, Mr. Dubois. Save the mother. Think of nothing but the mother. I will follow you. The emperor got out of his bath precipitately, giving me scarcely time enough to dry him. He put on his dressing gown and went downstairs. I know that he embraced the empress tenderly, recommended her to be courageous, and held her hand for some time. But unable to restrain his emotion, he retired to an adjoining salon, and there, listening to the slightest sounds and trembling with fear, he spent a quarter of an hour in cruel anguish. It was necessary to use instruments. Marie Louise perceived them and said with sorrowful bitterness, must I be sacrificed then because I am an empress? Madame de Montesquieu, who was holding her hand, said to her, Courage, madame, I have been through all that. I assure you that your precious life is not in danger. The labor lasted 26 minutes and was very painful. The feet of the child came first and great efforts were necessary in order to extricate the head. The emperor was waiting in the dressing room. He was as pale as death and seemed beside himself. At last, the child was born. Then the emperor rushed into the room and embraced the empress with extreme tenderness without even glancing at the child who was believed to be dead. It did, in fact, remain seven minutes without any sign of life. A few drops of brandy were blown into its mouth. It was slapped lightly all over the body with the palm of the hand. It was covered with hot napkins. At last, it uttered a cry. The emperor sprang from the arms of the empress to embrace this son, whose birth was for him the last and highest gift of fortune. He seemed overwhelmed with joy. He would turn from the mother to the child and from the child to the mother and appeared unable to satisfy himself with gazing at both. When he came back to his room to dress his face, it shone with delight. On seeing me, he said, Well, Constant, we have a big boy. He is splendidly made for ear pulling, for example. He announced it in the same way to all other persons whom he met. It was in these effusions of domestic joy that I could appreciate how profoundly the pleasures of family life were felt by this great soul who was supposed to be sensitive to glory alone. From the instant when the great bell of Notre Dame and the steeples of the different parishes of Paris began to make themselves heard in the middle of the night, until that when the cannon announced the happy delivery of the empress and extreme agitation was perceptible all over the city. At daybreak, crowds began pouring towards the Tuileries. The courts and docks were encumbered by them. Everyone was anxiously awaiting the first discharge of the cannon. But this curious spectacle occurred not merely at the Tuileries and the neighboring quarters. By half past nine o'clock, you might see people in the streets most remote from the chateau and in all parts of Paris, stopping to count with emotion the successive discharges. The 22nd, which announced the birth of a boy, was greeted with general acclamations to the expected silence, which had suspended as if by enchantment. The progress of all who were scattered throughout the various quarters of the city succeeded a movement of enthusiasm difficult to describe.
In that 22nd canon, there was a whole dynasty, an entire future. Hats flew into the air. People ran up to meet entire strangers and with mutual embraces shouted, Long live the Emperor! Old soldiers shed tears of joy in reflecting that by their sweat and their exhaustion, they had aided in preparing the heritage of the King of Rome and that their laurels were to shelter the cradle of a dynasty. Napoleon, hidden behind the curtain of one of the Empress's windows, enjoyed the spectacle of the popular delight and seemed profoundly affected by it. His eyes swam with tears, and he came in that condition to embrace his son. Glory had never caused him to shed a tear. But the happiness of being a father had softened this heart, which the most brilliant victories and most sincere evidences of public admiration seemed scarcely to touch. And in fact, if Napoleon was ever justified in believing in his fortune, it was on the day when he, who had begun life as a second son of a Corsican family, had been made by an Austrian archduchess, the father of a king. In the course of a few hours, the event which France and Europe had been awaiting with great impatience had become the private festival of every family. At half past 10 o'clock, Madame Blanchard went up in a balloon from the military school to spread the news of the birth of the king of Rome in all the towns and villages she might pass. The happy event was announced by telegraph in all quarters, and by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, replies had been received from Lyon, Lille, Brussels, Antwerp, Brest, and several other large cities of the empire. As may easily be believed, these replies were in perfect accord with the sentiments of the capital. To respond to the eagerness of the crowds continually besieging the doors of the palace for tidings of the empress and her august infant, it had been decided that one of the chamberlains on duty should remain from morning till evening in the first salon of the grand apartment to receive those who should present themselves and to acquaint them with the contents of the bulletins, which Her Majesty's physicians were to send in twice a day within a few hours extraordinary Couriers were carrying all over the roads the news of the accouchement of the empress. Some of the emperor's pages were charged with this mission to the Italian Senate and the municipal bodies of Milan and Rome. In all the fortified cities and in the ports, orders were given for the same salvas as in Paris and for the draping of the fleets. A lovely evening favored the special rejoicings of the capital. The houses had been spontaneously illuminated. Those who seek to divine from external appearances the real sentiments of a people on such occasions remarked that the upper stories of houses situated in the Faubourgs were as light as the most sumptuous hotels and handsomest houses of the capital. Public edifices, which under other circumstances become noticeable by reason of the darkness of the surrounding buildings, were scarcely so in this profusion of lights, which public gratitude had kindled in every window. The boatmen gave an impromptu fete on the water, which lasted half the night and was participated in by an immense crowd on the river banks who testified the utmost joy this people which for 30 years had been exper experiencing so many emotions and which had fed so many victories displayed as lively an enthusiasm as if this were a first festivity or signified a happy alteration in its destiny verses were sung or recited in all the theaters and there was not a poetical form from ode to the fable which was not employed to celebrate the event of march 20th 1811 i learned from a very well informed person that the sum of 100,000 francs previously deducted from the emperor's private funds was divided between monsieur dick volier secretary of accounts to the chamber between the authors of the poesies which were set to the tuileries and finally fashion which exploits the least events gave birth to stuffs entitled Things R Roi de Rome, King of Rome. Just under the old regime, there had been Things Dauphin. At nine o'clock in the evening of March 20th, the King of Rome received private baptism in the chapel, chapel of the Tuileries. The ceremony was magnificent. The Emperor Napoleon, surrounded by the princes and princesses and all his court, took his place in the middle of the chapel in an armchair surrounded by a day with a pre-dieu, a granite plinth supporting a magnificent gilt vase, which was to serve as a baptism 
baptismal font had been placed on a white velvet carpet between the altar and the balustrade. The emperor was grave, but paternal affection made his countenance look happy. One might have thought he felt half relieved of the burden of empire by the sight of the august infant, who seemed destined one day to receive it from his father's hands. When he had approached the baptismal font to present the child for private baptism, there was a moment of silence and recollection which afforded a touching contrast with the noisy gaiety which was even then animating an immense crowd on the outside who had been drawn into the neighborhood of the Tuileries from all parts of Paris by the magnificent illuminations and splendid fireworks. Madame Blanchard, who had started in a balloon an hour after the King of Rome was born to spread the news of the places she should pass through on her aerial voyage, had first descended at St. Thibault near Lanier. But as the wind failed her there, she returned to Paris. Her balloon went up again after her departure and fell anew in a market town six leagues distant. The inhabitants, finding nothing in it but some clothes and provisions, never doubted that the intrepid balloonist had been wrecked. But just as the news of her death was sent to Paris, Madame Blanchard herself arrived there and dispelled all anxiety. A great many persons had doubted the pregnancy of Marie Louise. Some thought that it was feigned. I have never been able to understand the stupid arguments put forward on the subject by these persons and which malevolence sought to foist upon the public. The singular thing about it and what proves that for the most part it proceeded from bad faith and folly was that while some accused the emperor of libertinage, the others believed him incapable of making a 19-year-old princess a mother. Thus hatred falsifies the judgment. If Napoleon had had illegitimate children, why could he not have a legitimate one? Especially when a young wife whose health was generally known to be flourishing. For the rest, this was not the first, nor it the last false rumor of the sort that Napoleon gave rise to. His position was too high and his glory too brilliant not to occasion exaggerated sentiments, whether of admiration or hatred. There were also malevolent persons who were pleased to say that Napoleon was somewhat incapable of tender sentiments, and that the happiness of being a father did not penetrate to the depths of his soul, which was devoured by ambition. Among a thousand traits, I can cite one little anecdote which touches me particularly and which I am all the better pleased to relate because while it gives a victorious reply to the calumnies of which I speak, it also proves the very special kindliness with which His Majesty honored me. Both as a father and a faithful servant, I experience a satisfaction sweet Though painful in setting it down in these memoirs, Napoleon was very fond of children. One day he asked me to bring him mine. I went out to look for him. Meanwhile, Monsieur de Talleyrand was introduced to the Emperor's apartment. The conversation lasted a long time. My child grew tired of waiting, and I took him back to his mother. Not long afterwards, he was attacked by the group. This cruel malady against which His Majesty had thought himself bound to make a special appeal... Two, the medical faculty of Paris carried off many children from their families. Mine died in Paris. We were then at the Chateau of Compiègne. I received the sad tidings just as it was time to go down to the toilette. I was too overwhelmed by this loss to repair to my duties. The emperor sent to inquire what prevented me from coming. And when he was told that I had just heard of the death of my son, he said kindly, Poor Constant, what a horrible affliction. We fathers know what that is. Not long afterwards, my wife went to see the Empress Josephine at Malmaison. This amiable princess deigned to receive her in the little salon which led into her sleeping room. There she made her sit down beside her and tried to console her by affecting words. She said we were not the only ones stricken by this misfortune, that she had also lost her grandson by the same malady. As she said so, she began to weep. For this souvenir renewed in her soul her recent grace. My wife bathed the hands of this excellent princess with her tears. Josephine added a thousand touching things, seeking to alleviate her troubles by sharing them, and thus to reawaken resignation in the heart of a poor mother. The memory of this kindness soothed our former sorrows, and I own that it is both an honor and a consolation for us to remember the august sympathies which the loss of this dear infant excited in the hearts of Napoleon and Josephine. No one will ever know how sensitive and compassionate this princess was, especially to the griefs of others and what treasures of kindliness her beautiful soul contained. 
Chapter 18. Napoleon was accustomed to draw comparisons between Marie Louise and Josephine, attributing to the latter all the advantages of art and grace, and to the former the charms of simplicity, modesty, and innocence. Occasionally there was something infantine in this simplicity, and I will cite but one example of this which came to me from a good source. The young empress, believing herself to be ill, consulted Monsieur Corvisart, who very clearly saw that her imagination alone was affected, and it was probably mere nervousness. Hence, he contented himself with prescribing some pills composed of breadcrumbs and sugar, which the empress took and found herself better. She thanked Monsieur Corvisart for her recovery, and as may readily be believed, he did not think proper to explain to her this little fraud. Having been educated in a German in court and learned French only with masters. Marie Louise spoke that language with the difficulty one usually finds of expressing oneself in a foreign tongue. Among the vicious locutions she sometimes employed and which in her gracious mouth were not devoid of charm, there was one that particularly struck me because she often used it. Napoleon, qu'est-ce que veux-tu? Instead of qu'est-ce que tu veux? What do you want? She's asking wrongly. The emperor displayed the greatest affection for his young wife, and yet he subjected her to all the rules of etiquette to which the empress adapted herself with the best possible grace. In the month of May 1811, their majesties made a journey to the departments of Calvados and La Manche and were received with enthusiasm by all the cities. The emperor marked his sojourn at Kien by gifts, favors, and benevolent actions. Several young men belonging to good families obtained sub-lieutenancies. 130,000 francs were devoted to different charities from Kien. Their majesties went to Cherbourg on the day after their arrival. The emperor went out on horseback early in the morning, visited the heights of the city, went aboard of several vessels, and was everywhere surrounded by a crowd who thronged about him, crying, Long live the emperor! The next day, his majesty held several councils, and in the evening visited all the naval establishments, even going to the bottom of the dock, hollowed out by the live rock to receive the ships of the line, and which was to be covered with 55 feet of water. In this brilliant journey, the empress had her share in the enthusiasm of the inhabitants, and in return, she gave a cordial reception to the regional authorities in the different receptions which took place. I intentionally lay stress on these details. They prove that the joy occasioned by the birth of the King of Rome was not confined to Paris but that, on the contrary, the provinces sympathized marvelously with the capital. The return to Paris of their majesties renewed the rejoicings and festivities. The ceremony of the baptism of the King of Rome and the fetes by which it was accompanied were celebrated in Paris with a pomp worthy of their object. For spectators, they had the entire population of Paris augmented by a prodigious throng of foreigners of all classes. At four o'clock, the Senate started from its palace, the Council of State from the Tuileries, the legislative body from its palace, the Court of Cassation, the Court of Accounts, the Council of the University, the Imperial Court from their usual place of session, the Municipal Body of Paris, and the deputations from the 49 good cities from the Hotel de Ville. On their arrival at the Metropolitan Church, these bodies were placed according to their rank by the masters and assistants of ceremonies to the right and left of the throne, from the choir to the middle of the nave. The diplomatic court entered the tribune intended for it at five o'clock. At half past five o'clock, Canada announced the departure of their majesties from the palace of the Tuileries. The imperial cortege was of dazzling magnificence, the superb uniform of the troops, the richness and elegance of the carriages, the brilliancy of the costumes afforded a ravishing spectacle, those acclamations of the people which resounded along the passage of their majesties, those houses tapestried with festoons and draperies, those flags floating from the windows, that long file of carriages whose horses and ornamentation successfully augmented in magnificence and followed each other as if in hierarchy order that immense apparatus of a fete animated by a real sentiment and ideas of the future and all that is profoundly graven in my memory and often occupies even yet the long leisure hours of the old servant of a family which has disappeared the ceremony of the baptism was carried out with unaccustomed pomp 
and solemnity after the baptism, the emperor took his august son in his arms and showed him to the spectators acclamations, which until then had been restrained by the sanctity of the ceremony and the majesty of the place. At once broke out from every side. When the prayers were ended, their majesties repaired to the Hotel de Ville at 8 o'clock in the evening and were received there by the municipal body. A brilliant concert and a banquet had been offered to them by the city of Paris. The decoration of the banquet hall displayed the arms of the 49 good cities. Paris, Rome, and Amsterdam coming first. The 46 others in alphabetical order. The banquet over, their majesties went to take their place in the concert hall. After the concert, they repaired to the throne room, where all the invited guests formed a circle. The emperor went around it, speaking affably, and sometimes even familiarly to the majority of the persons composing it, not one of whom failed to remember the benevolent words addressed to him. Finally, before they retired, their majesties were invited to enter the artificial garden, which had been formed over the court of the Hotel de Ville. The decoration of it was very elegant. At the back of the garden, the Tiber was represented by abundant streams, the course of which was most artfully arranged and diffused a pleasant coolness. Their majesties left the Hotel de Ville at half past eleven and re-entered the Tuileries by the light of the most elegant illuminations and luminous emblems in the most delicate taste. The serenest weather and the mildest temperature had favored this delightful day. The aeronaut, Garonet, who started from Paris at half past six in the evening, descended next morning at Mao, department of saint et oise After having rested there, he got into his balloon again and continued on his way. The provinces vied in magnificence with the capital in celebrating the fetes of the birth and baptism of the king of Rome. All that could be imagined of the most curious design, whether in emblems or illuminations, had been executed in order to impart greater pomp to these festivities. Each city had been guided as to its manner of rendering homage to the new king, either by its geographical situation or its special destination. Thus, at clermont Ferrand, an immense fire had been kindled at six o'clock in the evening on the summit of Puy de Dume. At the height of more than 5,000 feet, several departments could enjoy all night this singular and majestic spectacle. In the harbor of Flushing, the vessels were covered with streamers and flags of all colors. In the evening, the entire squadron was illuminated. Thousands of lanterns suspended from the masts, yards, and shrouds afforded an enchanting sight. All of a sudden, at the signal of a fusee fired from the admiral's ship, all the vessels simultaneously vomited forth sheaves of flame which outlined on an inky sky those imposing masses repeated by a sea as smooth as glass. We did nothing but pass from one fete to another. It was bewildering. The rejoicings of the baptism were in fact followed by a fete given by the emperor in the private park of St. Cloud. From the morning, the road from Paris was covered with equipages and pedestrians. The fete took place in the closed park, the Orangery, all of whose tubs decorated the front of the chateau, was ornamented with rich hangings, temples, and kiosks rose amidst the thickets. The entire length of the avenue of chestnut trees was decked with garlands of colored lamps, fountains of orgiat, and current, current shrub had been so distributed that every person present could refresh himself. Elegantly served tables were laid in the alley. The whole park was illuminated by fire pots concealed in the shrubbery, of the thickets. Madame Blanchard had been ordered to hold herself in readiness to start at half past nine o'clock at a given signal. At nine, the balloon being filled, she got into her car. She was taken to the extremity of the Swan Pond opposite the chateau. Just at the moment of departure, she was maintained in this position and at a height which considerably surpassed that of the tallest trees, so that for more than half an hour, she could be seen by all the spectators present at the 
the Fet. At 35 minutes past nine, a fusee set off from the Chateau having given the expected signal. The intrepid aeronaut was seen to rise majestically into the air before the assembly gathered in the throne room. On reaching a certain height, she set fire to a star in fireworks of immense size hung around the car of which she occupied the center. This star, which during seven or eight minutes launched from its points and angles a great quantity of other little stars produced the most extraordinary effect. This was the first time that a woman had ever been seen to rise boldly into the air surrounded by fireworks. She seemed to be riding on a chariot of fire at an immense height. I thought myself in a fairy palace. All that part of the gardens which their majesty passed through presented a spectacle of which it is impossible to form an idea. The illuminations were designed with perfect taste. The games afforded a great variety and numerous orchestras hidden among the trees added still more to the enchantment. At a given signal, three pigeons flew from the top of a column surmounted by a vase of flowers and came to offer their majesty several ingenious devices. Further away, German peasants were waltzing on a charming greensward and crowning the bust of her imperial majesty with flowers. The nymphs and shepherds of the opera were executing dances. Finally, a stage had been erected amongst the trees in order to represent the village fete, a divertisement composed by Mr. Etienne and set to music by Niccolo. The emperor and empress were watching this spectacle from underneath the canopy when there suddenly came an abundant shower which fluttered all the spectators. Their majesties being sheltered by the canopy did not at first perceive the rain. The emperor was talking at the time with the mayor of Lyon. The latter was complaining of a small demand for the stuffs of that city. Napoleon, noticing that a heavy shower was falling, said to this functionary, I warrant you that there will be plenty of orders tomorrow. The emperor kept his place during a great part of the storm. The courtiers, dressed in silks and velvets, and with uncovered heads, received the rain with a laughing air. The poor musicians, drenched to the bone, could no longer draw a sound from their instruments, which had either been broken or had their strings relaxed by the rain. It was time to put an end to this. The emperor gave the signal for departure and withdrew. On that day, Prince Aldebrandini, who accompanied the empress in the capacity for his equerry, was so lucky as to burrow an umbrella to shelter Marie-Louise. There was great dissatisfaction in the group from which this loan was made because the umbrella was not returned. On that evening, Prince Borghese and the Princess Polly narrowly escaped falling into the Seine with their carriage as they were returning to their country seat of Neuilly. Those who delight in drawing omens, and especially those who in very small numbers beheld with vexed eyes the joys of the empire, did not fail to remark that all the fetes given to Marie-Louise had invariably been disturbed by some accident. They talked affectedly of the ball given by the Prince Schwarzenberg at the time of the espousals of their majesties, of the fire that had consumed the dancing hall, and of the tragic death of several persons, notably that of the princess sister. They drew evil auguries from this coincidence, some through malevolence, and to sap the enthusiasm inspired by Napoleon's lofty fortune, others through a superstitious credulity, as if they were material for a serious comparison between a fire which cost the lives of several persons and the very ordinary ordinary accident of a June rainstorm, which spoiled dresses and wet to the bone thousands of spectators. It was an extremely amusing spectacle for him, who had no finery to spoil and who ran no risk of catching cold to see these poor women drenched by the rain, fleeing from one side to the other, or without a cavalier, cavalier, cavalier and seeking shelter, which was nowhere to be found. Some of them were so lucky as to find modest umbrellas, but the majority saw the flowers on their heads beaten down by the rain or their trimmings all dripping with water, trailing on the ground in a pitiful way. When it was necessary to return to Paris, carriages were lacking. The coachman had prudently considered that the fete would last until morning and had not troubled themselves to wait for people all night. Those who had equipages could not use them. The throng was such that it was almost impossible to move about. Several ladies lost their way and returned to Paris on foot. Others lost their shoes, and it was a pity to see their pretty little feet in the mud. Happily, 
There were very few accidents. The doctor and the bed set everything to rights. But the emperor laughed a good deal over this adventure and said it would be profitable to the manufacturers. Monsieur de Remusin, so good, so eager to render service, so forgetful of himself for others, had succeeded in obtaining an umbrella. He met my wife and mother-in-law who were making their escape like the rest. He took each under an arm and brought them back to the palace without the least damage. During an hour, he kept on making this journey from the palace to the park and from the park to the palace. And he had the happiness of being useful to a large number of ladies whose toilets he thus saved from utter ruin. This was a trait of gallantry for which everyone bore him infinite goodwill because there was blended with it a sentiment of touching kindness. Chapter 19. This year seemed to be that of Fetz. I dwell upon it with pleasure because it preceded a year which was that of misfortunes. 1811 and 1812 afford a striking contrast. All those flowers which were lavished on the fetes of the king of Rome and his august mother covered an abyss. All that enthusiasm was changed to mourning a few months later. Never were fetes more brilliant, followed by more startling reverses. Let us then once more abandon ourselves to the charms of the final rejoicings which preceded 1812. They are souvenirs which I need in order to strengthen me before I enter upon that epic of profitless sacrifices of bloodshed without either preserving or gaining of glory with no results. The Empress's birthday was celebrated August 25th at Trianon. From early morning, the road between Paris and Trianon was covered with an immense number of carriages and pedestrians. The same sentiment impelled the court, the middle classes, and the people to the delightful rendezvous of the fete. All ranks were blended. All went pell-mell. I have never seen a crowd more singularly diversified or present a more touching medley of all conditions. Ordinarily, the public of this sort of fetes belongs to one class only, with a slight sprinkling of modest burgesses. That is all. Rarely are there people with equipages, more rarely still any courtiers. Here, there was everything. There were no people so humble that they could not give themselves the satisfaction of elbowing a countess or some other noble denizen of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. All Paris appeared to be at Versailles, that city so fair but with so sad a beauty, which since the last king seemed widowed of its population. Those broad streets where not a person was to be seen, those squares, the least of which would contain all the inhabitants of Versailles, and which barely contained the courtiers of the great king, that magnificent solitude, which is called Versailles, has suddenly been peopled by the capital. The private houses could not shelter. The crowd arriving from all quarters. The park was inundated by promenaders of every age and sex. In those immense alleys, people trod on each other's heels. They suffered for lack of air on that vast airy plain. They were crowded on that stage of a great public festivity as one is at the balls given in those Paris salons, which are intended for a dozen persons, and into which vanity squeezes 150. Great preparations had been going on for four or five days in the delightful gardens of Trianon, but on the eve of the fete, the sky had been cloudy. Many toilettes for which people had been in a hurry were prudently put by, but the next day, a fine blue sky, having reassured everybody, they set up for Trianon, in spite of souvenirs of the storm which had dispersed the spectators at the Fed of St. Cloud. Nevertheless, at three o'clock, a copious shower created a momentary fear lest the evening should end badly. Pluie du soir faisant son devoir. The afternoon rain doing its duty. As the proverb says, it happened on the contrary that this mishap merely embellished the fete by cooling the burning August atmosphere and laying the incommodious dust. At six o'clock, the sun had reappeared and the summer of 1811 had not a milder or more agreeable evening. All the architectural lines of the Grand Trianon were ornamented with different colored lanterns. In the gallery might be seen 600 women dazzling with youth and rich attire. The Empress addressed 
gracious words to several of them, and they were generally enchanted with the affability and amiable manners of a young princess who had lived in France only 15 months. At this fete, as at all those of the empire, there was no lack of poets to chant the praises of those whom it referred. There was a theater, and they played a piece written for the occasion, the author of which, Monsieur Alessandre de Chazé, I perfectly remember, but whose title I have forgotten. At the close of the piece, the principal artist of the opera executed a ballet, which was thought very pretty. The performance over their majesties began their promenade in the park of the little trianon. The emperor, hat in hand, gave his arm to the empress and was followed by the entire court. They went in the first place to the eel of love. All the enchantments of fairyland, all of its magic spells were there united. The temple rising in the middle of the lake was magnificently illuminated and the water reflected its blazing columns. A multitude of elegant barks furred in all directions this lake which seemed on fire and were manned by a swarm of loves who appeared to be playing in the shrouds. Musicians hidden on board executed melodious airs and this harmony at once sweet and mysterious which seemed to issue from the bosom of the waves added still more to the magic of the picture and the charm of the illusion. To this spectacle succeeded scenes of another description. Rural scenes of Flemish tableau with its good jolly faces and its rustic unrestrained groups of inhabitants of each French province, which made it appear as if all parts of the empire had been invited to this fete. In a word, the most diverse spectacles attracted the gaze of their majesties by turns. On arriving at the salon of Polyhymnia, they were received by a charming choir who sang, if I remember, the music of Monsieur Payer and the words of the same Monsieur Alessandre de Chazé. At last, after a magnificent supper, which was served in the great gallery, their majesties withdrew. It was one o'clock in the morning.